The Jane Austen Project, Kathleen Flynn in conversation with Laura Thomas, in partnership with Nicholas Books and the UM Life and Times of Lizzie Bennett exhibit. So thank everyone for coming out on this um, beautiful snowy night to join um, me in welcoming author Kathleen Flynn. Um, her delightful novel is the subject of our talk and conversation tonight. Um, and the Jane Austen Project follows travelers Dr. Rachel Katzman and Liam Vanuken back to Jane Austen's time, um, which in this case was 1815, um, just uh, about a year before Jane uh, passed away. Uh, I just wanted to read you a wonderful review in Shelf Awareness, a review I think really captures um, this wonderful novel. Rachel's wry, observant narrative voice teaches readers the delights and hardships of life in 1815 with rich historical detail. In fact, one of my favorite things about this novel is the amazing wealth of detail um, about everything from um, the clothes to the way of life to domestic life. I mean, it's just fabulous. Um, Flynn renders the whole Austin clan vividly. Charming Henry, self-absorbed James, neurotic Mrs. Austin, disapproving Cassandra, Jane is as witty and wise a friend as Rachel could wish for, but the latter can never forget that she has a set return date and a task to complete. Flynn's conclusion raises and leaves lingering a few unsettling questions. How much change is too much? Can anyone travel back in time without drastically affecting the future? And is a manuscript, even a completed version of the Watsons, worth a life? Well, I think yes, but um, <laughs> the reviewer okay, thinks that question is lingering. So Kathleen, um, you are an editor at the New York Times. Um, you work uh, at the Upshot. You hold a BA from Barnard College and an MA from the University of North Carolina. You've taught English in Hong Kong. You've washed dishes on Nantucket, which sounds fabulous, I have to say. Glamorous. And of course, you are a life member of the Jane Austen Society of North America. Um, you live in Brooklyn with your husband and your shy fox terrier, Olive. So welcome, and thank you for joining us in Ann Arbor. Thank you so much for, for having me. So did you want to start off by just reading a, a passage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to read a short passage. Um, this is from about a third of the way into the book. It, it, it comes... How much should I explain about the book? Do I need to? It, it, they've traveled back in time. Just bear with me on that. They've traveled back in time. Uh, they have inserted themselves into the life of Henry Austin. They've kind of gotten to know him. They've been in London. They've established themselves. They have a house, etc. This uh, passage that I'm going to read comes the day after Rachel has met Jane Austen for the first time. And she's kind of just thinking about stuff. So that's, can everyone hear me? Do I sound okay? Yeah. Okay, great. I woke up with a sore jaw, like I'd been clenching my teeth in my sleep, in a memory of a dream about Isaac of York, the emotionally overwrought moneylender in Ivanhoe. I did not have to work to understand. Ivan, Isaac personified my anxiety about what I decided against asking Liam on the way home. But would they even recognize a Jew? I wondered, eyes still closed. Or would they expect the hook-nosed caricature of satirical prints? Chances are, Jane never saw one before, up close. But Henry, could you work as a London banker and never? But I had more immediate problems. Yesterday, meeting her had loomed as a huge achievement. Today, it made me realize how many hurdles remained. We had to devise a reason to be in Chawton, in a way, not just to be invited to her house, but to get into the very bedroom of the two sisters, the probable location of the letters and the Watsons, to earn her trust and to know her so well that she would confide details of her illness. Yet it was clear she did not like people easily or right away, unlike her brother, and had no motive to cultivate them for business reasons, as he did. How to make her like me it seemed hopeless. What did I have to offer? My starstruck adoration would only scare her. 
my knowledge of her future, posthumous fame. But what use was that? How to leverage it? Perhaps in superior understanding. What I love about Jane Austen has never been the marriage plot. The quest for a husband in her novels struck me, even when I was younger and more susceptible, as a MacGuffin, or at least as a metaphor. I have always suspected this is how she meant her books to be read. Many people from my world would find it strange, even tragic, that the author of such emotionally satisfying love stories apparently never found love herself. But I didn't. For one thing, she was a genius, burning with a desire to create undying works of art, not a cozy home for a husband and children. For another, she wrote the world she knew and what she felt would appeal to readers. The marriage plot is interesting mostly for how it illuminates the hearts of her characters, what they learn about themselves on the way to the altar. She concerns herself with bigger questions, how to distinguish good people from plausible fakes, what a moral life demands of us, the problem of how to be an intelligent woman in a world that had no real use for them. If I could get to the point of talking about her books with her and make it clear that I understood this, Maybe then she would see that I was not like everyone else. And I would not need to steal the Watsons. She would share the manuscript with me of her own accord. I love that passage. I'm so glad you read it. Um, I think it just really captures you know, so much about um, what surprised and gave me so much joy about this novel that you know, Rachel um, is using what we know, the Jane we know, the Jane who has become Jane Austen, in order to befriend the real Jane, who is not yet the Jane that she will become. It's right? completely mind-bending. It's a real pleasure. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of authors would have um, conceived of the idea of writing a novel about Jane's final years and you know, the, the mystery of this unfinished manuscript is straight historical fiction. Um, and yet, you made the decision to uh, you know, to frame it with this time travel plot. So what inspired you to blend historical fiction and, and a time travel novel? How did that, how did that idea come to you? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think that it never occurred to me to just, when I got the idea of writing a novel about Jane Austen, it always involved time travel. Uh, that, was, that idea was there from the beginning. And I think what interested me was kind of the collision of the past and the present or the future. Um, you know, to write, like, I think it was this wish to know what it was really like. Um, you know, not only what Jane Austen was really like, but what that world was really like. And even though historical fiction, you know, at its best really can do that. Like I think about um, Wolf Hall, like, you know, the Hilary Mantel books or, um, Patrick O'Brien, which is actually really what inspired this. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, you know, he wrote books about a sea captain during the Napoleonic Wars. And you really feel like you're there, like it just puts you there. Um, why, did, but I felt like I wanted that awareness of, of how strange it was. And I, to me, the strangeness was what was interesting. And sending a person from the future, you would sort of see that more clear, you know, it would sort of set it into relief. And it's interesting, too, because you made the decision um, not only to have Rachel travel back in time, but Rachel is not from our time. She's from a future time. And so both times are strange in the novel. Um, mm -hmm. So did, was that part of your original concept, was to always have Rachel and Liam be from um, a time future to us yes. that we don't know? Well, I think that I wanted the time travel to have at least a veneer of scientific plausibility. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want it to be magical. I, you know, again, I don't know. That just was always there. I don't know why. There were certain rules I set for myself, and there's some of them that I just changed as I went along. But that was, and I think it's, I, I, it's more that not necessarily, like I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, well, how far in the future should it be? Like, when could they have actually done this? Mm -hmm. Then I began to realize that actually it's maybe not even, it's like a different world. The way that, for example, the golden compass is like, Lyra is in Oxford, but it's like a different Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it was, um, I think it was, it was that. It was more the practical 
problem. Like I couldn't set it in 2018 and actually have people a travel, travel institute. To, to, to. <laughs> I mean, I guess I could, but I don't. I don't know. That's it's not a very satisfying answer. I'm sorry. Well, we certainly know that um, in this future, Jane Austen is a bigger deal even than she is now. So you'll all be happy if those of you who haven't read the book, she's really huge she's, she's in huge, the future. You know? so much so that people get sent back, you know, to befriend her. Right. So, uh, you know, the, the bulk of the novel, of course, is dedicated to Jane and her historical time. Um, and so I'm interested to hear a little bit about how you went about researching that. But also, could you talk a little bit about your research for the time travel piece? Because it seems like that would be um, more <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. difficult to, to get your hands on. It is um, more difficult and in a way easier because it's, I don't know, that's not. I think that I, I really, I did a lot of research about Jane Austen, obviously, because I really, I felt like, okay, this is a completely ridiculous idea, but the kind of books that I always admired as a reader were books that had some ridiculous element, but everything else was quite factual. Um, so I think about a book like The Golem and the Genie. I don't know if you've read that. It's a, it's a wonderful book about, um, it's about a, a golem and a genie, but it's set in 1900 New York, and everything about it is, like, New York is very well imagined, it's very real, but there's these fantastical creatures. Um, so I wanted it, I wanted a story about time travel to be really grounded in fact, in history, and I wanted you to feel like you were there. So I, I read a lot of books um, about different things, you know, about Jane Austen, about social history, I read biographies of various people that were you know, I was trying to get a sense of the whole world, not just, you know, not obviously can't get the whole world, but this, the world around her, like what was going on in, in you know, in politics, in war, in, in science, um, but also not to just put it all in, but to feel like it was there off the page. Um, I noted that you brought in historical characters like Bo Brummel, I thought was an interesting uh, mention. Right, right. You know, the, the Regency. Dandy. Um, dandy fashion. Style. First metrosexual. Yeah. <laughs> um, and a lot of it was kind of chance. Like, I, I went to a, um, somebody wrote a biography of Bo Brummel, and I, I actually went, the Jane Austen Society a few years ago had him come and talk about the book. Like, he's also, um, he's also an actor, and he's like, all these. British people, like they just, they do all these other things and write books. Like the, the book I read about Wilberforce was actually by William Haig, the foreign secretary. Mm -hmm. Which is like, when does he have time? Like he's foreign secretary. <laughs> he, he, he wrote this really good biography of William Wilberforce. Um, but so like Wilberforce ended up there because yes. I read this whole book about him and he seemed to belong. Uh, so just, um, I, I read lots of books. I, I traveled some. I went to a lot of house museums. I became like a big fan of house museums because that's like I had, I really was, I spent a lot of time trying to picture their house in London. Um, like what would have been, you know, there. <coughs> I went to house museums. There's one in New York that's a little bit later. It's about 1830, 1840, but it's, it's pretty good. Like the layout, you know, was reminiscent. Um, there's one in Bristol that I went to. There's one in Dublin that's, that's really fantastic. That was actually the one that seemed to come closest to what I was picturing, because um, it's not super, super fancy, uh, but it's like a rich person's house. Um, because in the novel, they have to put up a good show. Right. You know, they have to um, seem like they would fit into Jane's social circle. Right. Right, yes. So. And it's so interesting, like I wrote an entire chapter in which they rent the house. I described everything, like they tour the house. They just, like I describe every floor and I took it all out. Like, but it's all, it's like in my mind. Good writing tip, right? <laughs> it's like don't, Not a, yeah. don't tell yeah. everything you know. Just, yes, you know, but sometimes you have to tell what you know and then take some of that right. out. Right. And, and that's know. like a really, as, as you know as a writer, like there's the whole like you put things in and you take them out and then you take them all out and you put like, one third back, or and some of the stuff you can't put back are the very coolest details, right? You mm -hmm. know, but mm -hmm. sometimes you have to let the story. You labor over a whole scene for years, and it ends up get leaving. But it's or it shows up in another form. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a it's a, it's a process. All right, so let's talk Jane. 
Jane. All right, I have some questions about Jane. So you talked a little bit about your research process. Um, I don't know that I would have the moxie to bring Jane Austen to the page, and so I'm wondering how you prepared to write Jane as a character. It was pretty presumptuous, I, and I, I really, <laughs> I really had trouble. I mean, that was really scary. I remember the first time I tried to write that scene; it, it was terrible, which goes without saying. But it was also, it was like, what am I doing? Who, who do I think I am? Uh, I think that, I, you know, the letters are really great for sort of imagining Jane, um, even though there, there's. Like the way that her mind works, um, that was helpful. I don't know. It, it was. How did I have the nerve? I can't remember now. You know, it's like I. Was there a point where you had to stop the research and just let her exist as she was going to exist? And I just think, write your way to her? I think she kind of gradually came into focus. So in earlier versions of this novel, we did not get to know her so well. She remained a more distant figure, and more of the story involved, um, I think, more with Henry and more with Rachel and Liam themselves. And I had more family members. Like at one point, we met a bunch of the nephews and nieces. And, and Jane remained kind of this mysterious figure for a while. And, I, and I, even though I think like that's probably more realistic, like if you actually could travel back in time and meet Jane Austen, she probably would be harder to get to know than the person I've, even though I think that was probably what she was like, like as a person, but to actually know that would be very hard. So I think um, even though the, the remote Jane seemed more plausible as fact, as fiction, it wasn't working. I needed to, to get closer and you know, you see in the process of the novel how Rachel is sort of like at first she's, Jane seems, you know, she also gets closer. So as, as the reader, but also as the writer, like it was, that was the same process for me, I think. I was going to say that really mimics Rachel's experience of Jane in the novel because in the beginning part, Jane is kept kind of at a distance. Rachel isn't able to get very close to her, access her. There are scenes where Rachel's kind of walking behind people and can't really hear what Jane is saying. Mm, and she feels like Liam, she likes yeah, Liam better because yeah. he's a man, you know. You horrible. know, there's just all this, yeah. And I'm thinking, I wonder if I'm gonna get to know Jane in this novel, and then of course, I, I won't do any spoiler alerts, but uh, yeah, yeah, that, and, and that the, dynamic yeah. does change. And the, yeah. the first time they meet her, their reaction is, is sheer terror, which I think would, yeah, yeah. would, would, would actually be the case, right? I mean, how intimidating really would that be? Messed it up, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So uh, as you were writing her character, maybe when you were finished, um, you know, drafting the novel through several drafts, was there anything about Jane's character that ended up surprising you, that you didn't expect to learn about her, know about her? Did she do anything that, that took you by surprise? I think that, you know, the thing about Jean Austen that's always surprising you is just how smart she is and how her mind is just constantly, I wouldn't say working faster than other people's minds, but working better. You know, you see it in the letters, you see this, there's this kind of free association of ideas or even in the novels, you know, she'll kind of, put together ideas in a way that, you know, is, is, seems very remarkable. And I think that that was just um, learning about her, particularly learning about the juvenilia and, and what a gene, you know, she was like Mozart, you know, in, in writing. Like she just had this very precocious, sophisticated approach. I think that surprised me. I mean, I, in a way, but in a way I, I knew that she was a genius. I just didn't really, I mean, I always admired her work without really thinking much about the person mm -hmm. until I set out to write this book. Uh, so yeah, I just, maybe it was like it came not so much as a surprise as like it coming into clearer, mm -hmm. clearer focus. I don't know if that. Yeah, that makes you know. a lot of sense. And again, it mimics really Rachel's experience of Jane, which is very interesting to me. Um, it will be interesting to all of you when you read the book. Was there, what would you say, maybe you can't say, 
given um, what you just said, but was what's the biggest difference between the Jane you created on the page and the living Jane? Is that just too hard to? Well, you know, of course, it's impossible to say what anyone is really like, right? Yeah, even yeah. even people that we know today. Um, I, I think that. Um, I guess is there, is there something that you deliberately fictionalize? I think only the her willingness to get to know them. Mm -hmm. That's the only. I think she really somebody some rich friends of Henry's who show up in 1815. Which she but on the other hand, I mean there is precedent. Like Mr. Hayden, who is appears in my book and he's a real person. Uh, Mr. Hayden was the apothecary. So Henry actually did get sick in the fall of 1815. And the letters to Cassandra describe. I mean Mr. Hayden became like a regular visitor to their house. He was apparently very charming. You know, there's some question of whether he was flirting with Jane or he was flirting with Fanny Knight. Um, so he was probably about 30. Jane is in her late 30s, Fanny's in her early 20s. So the, you know, it's either one is possible. But he, so maybe, you know, maybe if they were sufficiently charming, maybe she would have, so even that, it, it's hard to say. You but know? she was known to be pretty, to herself, you think? Pretty hard to get to know. People, you know, she had her family and people that she'd known all her life. You know, her friends from, you know, Martha Lloyd, you know, Martha Lloyd and some of the other, you know, the Gibbs sisters. But she wasn't super, um, you know, she doesn't seem to have wanted to be a literary figure, for example. You know, there's that famous thing that she had the chance to meet Madame de Stahl and she was like, no, Henry, forget it. I'm not going to go to a party with Madame de you know. uh, <laughs> so, you know, she seems to have been a little wary of, of being a public figure and of being, you know. And she kept her circle small, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think like a lot of writers, she probably just was kind of a private person. Mm -hmm. maybe. Probably needed to protect her time, too. Right, yeah. right. So Liam and Rachel had their work cut out for them, that's they for did. sure. They did. If it's OK, I'd like to ask a little bit about um, the influence of some of Jane's uh, novels on your novel. So um, again, I don't want to give any spoiler alerts to those of us who haven't read the book. Um, but Henry uh, uh, proposes to someone, and the scene is delightfully reminiscent of another famous proposal. It's not exactly like Darcy and Elizabeth Bennet, but it's got shades of that, and that just made me smile. Um, there were other points in the novel where I thought, oh, you know, I wondered if you went into the novel, you know, writing the novel, knowing that you were going to pay homage to certain, you know, scenes um, in in Jane Austen novels. That's a really interesting question. I, you know, I actually don't think so much when I think about Jane Austen. I don't think in terms of scenes so much. I think about characters and I think about situations. Um, it's funny, too, that the proposal scenes, the ones that, that Austin dramatizes are always a disaster. Mm -hmm. Like the successful ones, you don't really, she kind of cuts away. But you know, think of, like, there's the Darcy proposal, which is a disaster. The Collins proposal, which is a disaster. The Mr. Elton's proposal, which is, you know, like, dumpster <laughs> <Disaster>. fire. <laughs> um, what are, like, so they're all kind of, there's something very awkward about proposal scenes. Like, I think, and she kind of recognizes this. So I thought, I mean, obviously, when I thought about this book, it's like, it's like I'm sort of writing in response to Jane Austen. So I thought about, obviously, I read her books and reread her books. I thought about things, ways that the echoes, and I don't know now, like looking back on it, it's hard to say if I deliberately did that or I would find myself doing something that just always like, oh, that's kind of like so and so. So I can say right offhand, Mansfield Park. There are many, Ma Mansfield Park is the one that I found myself thinking about the most, maybe. Um, Rachel and Liam at one point actually say, oh, we're kind of like Henry and Mary Crawford. <laughs> like, you know, we're coming here, we're these people from outside, we're rich, we have, I mean, they don't say all this in the conversation, but that's what I'm thinking. Like, they have different morals, maybe. Um, there's also the sort of, you know, there's that weird kind of thing where, you know, Fanny's in love with Edmund, but Henry's in love with Fanny, and Edmund's in love with Mary, and it, it, so it's all kind of, I mean, that part is not, you know, I don't want to have an incest theme, but um, <laughs> I also think about, obviously there's, there's I mean, 
Elizabeth and Darcy, like every story that's a love story sort of owes something to that idea of not being attracted to a person and then sort of being attracted to a person. Emma, in the sense of Emma not really thinking she's quite clever, but not really seeing things entirely clearly, I think I definitely see Rachel that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's a first person narrator and she's, she's fairly reliable, I think, but she, there are things that she completely misses. And I think, I think about Emma a lot. Um, I think the ending has echoes of persuasion to me in that there's a kind of a coming together after an estrangement. Um, sense and sensibility, I think about, like, Jane and Cassandra are a little bit like Eleanor and Marianne in that, you know, Eleanor is the, you know, the older, smarter, more rational one. Um, have I missed any? Well, Northanger Abbey, of course, is so metafictional, which is also, this is like, here are people in a book who are meeting an author, you know, so it's, you know, as you say, like the real Jane Austen and the fictional Jane Austen. So that's also, I mean, you can't get away from Northanger Abbey. So really all of I think you got the canon in, in I, there. Did I yes, miss, did I miss one? <laughs> and of course, the subject of their mission is the Watsons, which is the unfinished. Right, so the I Watsons. think you got the entire. Right, right. Right. So Sanditon. There's no Sanditon, but I can never figure out what to do with Sanditon. Like, it, just, it makes me sad because she died. I, I don't even like to read it. It's like, it's just... So a related question to that is, um, I know you were uh, writing a lot of, uh, you know, historical figures, but were there any Jane Austen characters that you wanted to similarly pay homage to with any of the, uh, maybe the, the non-historical figures? Um, I mean, you mentioned uh, Emma being, you know, sort of like right. Rachel herself. That's, a, that's right. Yeah. And and Henry is a little bit like. I mean, I always think it's interesting that Henry, that she named Henry Crawford and Henry Tunley after her brother. I mean, not after. Her, I mean, she was, she did she did use the same names over and over again. But it's interesting that those characters. So to me, Henry Austin is a little bit like Henry Crawford, and he's a little bit like Henry Tunley. Um, I wondered how much you had fictionalized. Uh, Henry. Henry in the book, because um, he, he, early in the novel, he's one of my favorite characters. I was totally charmed by him. So those of you who have read the book, I don't know if you would agree with me. But as the novel unfolds, my view of him changes. And again, I'm not going to give anything away, but he seems, you know, not quite the guy I thought he was. So I, but I know that Jane was close with, I mean, yeah. she was closest to him of all her siblings. It seems, it seems to, certainly of all her brothers, it seems. Um, she seems to have been very close to him. Unfortunately, no letters to Henry have survived. So we don't really know too much about that. Um, yeah, Henry, uh, you know, there, there's a lot we don't know about Henry. But I didn't, I mean, I tried to stick with what I knew to be true about Henry and to kind of extrapolate from it and elaborate on it. Um, you know, we do know that he was very charming. He was very gregarious. He was the one who was in London. He was the one that had all these different professions. Um, he was the one who married his dashing cousin, who James was also in love with at one point. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, <laughs> There's a whole you know, other. Um, but you know, Henry, yeah, so I, I tried to sort of stick to the record. Mm -hmm. Um, later, somebody wrote an entire book about Henry Austin, which I was so sad that I hadn't found it when I, when I was writing. It was, it's about his bank business. It was, it's called The Banker's Sister. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, Jane Austen, so The Banker's Sister. So you didn't read Sister. that until after you No, it, was, it came out in 2017. And it was, it was sad because there's a lot of detail about the bankruptcy, which I had to kind of just, that part took place off stage because I really didn't know, I didn't know enough about it. I couldn't find... It was just stuff that I couldn't find. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to write a very interesting part of the book too. Yeah, your book, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we know that happened, but they didn't really write about that in the letters. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear. And this, you know, this was a, by a professor in England, and she, you know, had access to all this. You know, she went to records and. You Would know. they not have written about it in their letters? Can you guess that that wouldn't have been like the proper thing to do, or you know, I don't how. Well, Cassandra burnt a lot of letters, so, so maybe they it's have. possible that they talked about it. It's also possible that that was just a subject that was so upsetting that they just talked about it in person, mm -hmm. and they never wrote about it. Because remember, letters were shared kind of in public. Like, if you wrote a letter to your sister, you might also have to read it to your mother, so you wouldn't write anything 
Um, but in this case, I mean, they were, it was all in the family. So it's hard to say, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's, it's like if something terrible happens in your own family, you don't, you don't make a phone call where you explain it all, like, because you all know, you know, so. And this was around money, which is often a charged right, subject. Right, right. You know, speaking of charged subjects, too, another part of the novel I found fascinating was, so uh, Liam and Rachel's cover story is that they're, um, they've arrived so suddenly in London and are trying to um, get into the social circle because they've been in Jamaica and they've owned a plantation um, and that immediately makes the Austin family, you know, or at least Rachel, Rachel is afraid that it will reflect poorly on them because of slavery. So they come up with the cover story too that um, that they uh, freed their slaves. Manumission is the um, is the term, and so that's incredibly like Mansfield Park, mm -hmm, of course, mm -hmm. um, with right, the Bertram about, right, right. Um, family history. But I also wondered if you, I mean, it's a, it's a great cover story and it makes sense to the novel and I'm sure that's why you chose that. But did you also want to show a little bit about Jane's attitude towards slavery and manumission or yeah. the attitudes? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because that was the thing that worked, like when I, I don't remember exactly when I came up with that idea, but I was really happy when I did because it seemed to solve several problems at once. You know, so it explains why they don't know anybody. It explains why they're rich because that was like a huge, you know, these sugar fortunes were a huge thing. Um, it, but it also lets, you, you know, it was also a topic that was very hotly debated at the time. Um, and as we see with um, some friends of Henry Austin that we meet early on, the Tilsons, who are real people, they were mentioned in the letters. They did, Henry did have the bank with Mr. Tilson. Um, you know, they, the, and Mrs. Tilson was a fervent evangelical, which it was quite, like that, you know, that um, evangelicals now are sort of seen as, you know, it's a very kind of right wing thing, but at that time they were very, you know, kind of progressive mm -hmm. and, you know, very interested in this. You know, the whole topic of slavery was such a, a, a huge thing at this time. Britain had recently abolished the slave trade, so you couldn't ship slaves, but you could still have them. Um, so that was like a huge thing that was. It was a very interesting element that was kind of just there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, the, the and was manumission, you know, sort of the, uh, you know, was that was, was that it unusual that um, was, was that, that a thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I so I one of the I remember I spent like a whole bunch of time reading these books in the New York Public Library that you can't check out about like slavery in Jamaica, you know, because around this time people were going and they were writing these books about, I mean, of course later we get like slave narratives and stuff, but at that time they were going and just writing these pamphlets and books like this is what's happening and it's terrible and it's brutal and, and also just stuff about, um, you know, the economics of how it worked. So this thing of being able to, like, it was more common in Spanish colonies that people, that slaves actually were allowed to work for themselves for a certain period of time and buy, their own, buy themselves, basically. So it did happen that somebody would simply decide to, like I'm picturing that they could have just, they could have said to their slaves, okay, well, you know, you get to work for yourself however many days a week, we're gonna, you know, teach you to read, whatever. Uh, it's pretty unlikely, but it's not completely impossible, whereas just simply freeing them, I think nobody would believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there is some historical basis for this idea, but it's, it's a little far-fetched, and they, they try not to, you know, she's like, I don't really want to talk about this, you know, uh, right, because right. I'm so, but in fact, because maybe people would start asking too many questions. Right, right. But the Austins certainly seem relieved that that's the case, you know, and they're and, and Yeah, and slavery was something that people really, you know, people like the Austins would have really thought was really bad at this time. I mean, we see this in, in Emma, of course, with, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Mrs. Elton. And, you know, there's this implication that, that Mrs. Elton's family, because they're from Bristol, which was like where the, the, the boats came typically, that was like a center of sugar wealth. Mm -hmm. um, that you know there is something kind of really sleazy and reprehensible about slavery, even though lots of obviously Sir Thomas Bertram is mm -hmm. you know it's, so it's one of these things that people don't like to think about. 
but Jane created some unlikable characters you know, associated with it. So that probably right. reflected her exactly. attitude towards exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Rachel, in her own time as a doctor, it's very um, funny, that, well, funny ha-ha, and also sort of funny, you know, not so ha-ha, that when she goes back in time, you know, her medical expertise, you know, she has to sneak into people's sick rooms, and <laughs> Liam is posing right. as the doctor, and Liam's always having to ask her her advice, because in her time, she's the doctor. She travels freely. She did a lot of, um, you know, uh, mission work. I mean, she's completely her own person. And then she's transported back to 1815, well trained, you know, to have her freedoms constrained. But, you know, again, she can't even leave the house without a male escort. I mean, that's how constrained it was. I mean, reading the novel just made, you know, with with Jane Austen's novels, I, I forget how constrained women right. actually were. And that's what's so clever about Jane Austen, right, mm -hmm. is that you don't really see it. Like, there's this kind of indignation that's sort of hidden. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like the Brontes, you know, like Charlotte is just like constantly incandescent with rage. With the same, but it's the same thing. It's like this constraint, you know, on the freedoms of women. It's like Jane Austen just kind of takes that and works with it. And you see, you know, you see that in her novels. Like, she never stops to just, you know, to discuss how unfair the situation is. For example, that you know, the Longburn estate is going to be entailed away from, because they're girls. And so they're totally doomed. They have no, you know, there's no opportunity for them to make a living. They can't inherit property. Um, and yet, you know, so it's, it's like this thing that's there, but it's never spoken but of. But the characters go about sort of working that system. I mean, they exactly, know the system. Exactly, they work the system. And they, they figure it out. So, I mean, seen in that light, I'm starting to think of Rachel as being, you know, sort of the the id that these women could never have because, of course, she does, I mean, exactly. she has to play her part, but she does rail against it. So I wondered if there were characteristics about her that you, like, particularly brought to her character to highlight yeah, that kind of thing. absolutely. I mean, obviously, that's something I thought about a lot. Like, I think that's, one, to me, that's one of the sort of primary themes of the book is, because it started with this, you know, this question I had of, like, what would it be like to be Jane Austen, to be a woman and to be so smart and to have so few choices, you know, and this sort of goes like, what was it like in general to be a woman? Which I think, you know, it, it sucked basically. Um, and so Rachel, to me, I wanted to create a character that was very, um, you know, n not really buying into this and to sort of heighten the dramatic tension inherent in sending a modern woman back by making her, um, like, one of the things like I was also thinking about in this future imaginary world was that gender, you know, gender relations have improved since 1815, but in her world they're even more evolved, maybe. Mm -hmm. right. So I think that I tried to give Rachel some characteristics that we normally associate with men in our culture, and perhaps Liam some characteristics. So he's kind of, you know, he's kind of more... Artist, he's the artistic one, he's kind of intuitive, he's kind of, you know, I, I didn't want to make him like, you know, extremely sensitive, but he's sort of, um, he's sort of sensitive. I don't know. He was really into the clothes. He was into I the love clothes. that. <laughs> he's an actor, he was, he made was, perfect he sense. Was, he's, he's an you know, he's, yeah, he's, he's into the clothes. First he's thing much, he does is get his work He together. spends much more time thinking about clothes than Rachel does. That's a very good example. I forgot about that one. Thank you. Um, Whereas Rachel is kind of, um, she's confident, she's outspoken, she's physically adventurous, she's sexually adventurous. So she's really like not, um, you know, ready to conform to the gender norms of 1815 in that way. Even though she's prepared, she's prepared to play the part, but it, it goes against many of her own characteristics. So, and in the passage you read, and I, you know, I hadn't um, stopped to think about this so much until you reread um, read the passage that I had um, obviously taken note of the first time I read it. She's Jewish, mm. um, and uh, was that that must have been a deliberate choice on your part? But it doesn't. That doesn't seem to play some. I mean, she's nervous about being found mm. out. Mm. Um, 
But what, so what would Jane's circle, what would their attitude have been had they found out that she was in fact Jewish? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Because that's the thing. Was her fear founded? Uh, sort of. I mean, I, I think that, um, and again, that's sort of a thing that, I mean, she was always Jewish. From the first time I imagined Rachel, she was always Jewish. Uh, I can't really explain why, except that I just felt she was. Um, it, I think that it was, it was a way to make her more of an outsider. So Jews at that time in England, and actually it's interesting at the exhibit in the graduate library, the, one of the books is opened to a section about Jews in England. I was so happy, I wished that I could have turned the pages and kept reading it. Um, so there were, there were quite a few um, you know, Jews in England at this time, and there was, you know, the religion was sort of tolerated, but they were not accepted into like kind of normal, like they lived very much apart, I think. They were kind of seen as this strange other. Um, so that would have threatened the mission. I mean, absolutely, the Austins probably absolutely. would not have welcomed her into their They would have kind of kept her at arm's length. Um, so there's the, um, like several of the more disagreeable characters, like Jane Austen is not openly anti-Semitic. Um, unlike many authors of that time who will just casually throw in anti-Semitic references like Mariah Edgeworth, for example. Uh, some of the more disagreeable characters in Jane Austen will be heard to say, he's as rich as a Jew. Um, I think General um, Tilney says that. And, and that's sort of like, again, she's not really, but the fact that she puts this kind of slur into one of the less, one of the more unpleasant characters mm -hmm. suggests that she was not. Mm -hmm. An anti-Semite herself, although I'm. It's it's hard to say, you know, like what they would have. Another interesting example is in um, it's in one of Fanny Burney's books, uh, I, Cecilia or Camilla. I always mix them up. Um, the one where the rich heiress ends up in debt because she's trying to help out other people and she has to borrow money, so. But she doesn't, like, she goes to a Jewish money lender, but she can't go directly to it because she can't even, like, you know, it would be so improper to even be in the same room with this sort of disgraceful, disgusting person. So there's, like, an intermediary. Um, so that suggests, like, that portrayal in fiction suggests um, that they were, and also, um, of course, Ivanhoe, which I reference mm -hmm. constantly in this book, is a fascinating book to me. I don't know if any of you have read Ivanhoe. Um, it's, but it's about the Middle Ages, and, and there's a Jewish character in it, Isaac of York, also his daughter, Rebecca. And this is written in 1819, and Sir Walter Scott portrays them as just very exotic. Like, it's, they're not really entirely negative, but it's something very weird. Would the Watsons have been worth rescuing? What do you, so this is uh, uh, it's Watson's, a, yeah. What, it, it, she wrote five, five chapters of it? Is five that? chapters, yeah, about 18,000 words. Um, and it's such an interesting question. Like, the Watsons is such a weird anomaly in kind of Jane Austen's writing career. Would it have been another Emma? Would it have been another Sense and Sensibility? Oh, I mean, I think if it was Jane Austen, it, it would have been, it would have been good, right? I mean, even if it was, not as good, it still would have been interesting as like the way that the juvenilia is, or, or Lady Susan mm -hmm. is, um, it's not, you know, Lady Susan is kind of a weird book too, but it would have told us something about Jane Austen that, you know, we don't know now. So it would have, I mean, I don't think it would have been a, like a, a dud. You know? <laughs> but Jane herself, did Jane not. herself never finished it, so maybe she thought it would be a dud. It's like a really interesting question. So, you know, she never finished this manuscript, and yet she carried it around. She didn't destroy it. And, you know, this was the time when they didn't have a place to live. It wasn't like she just put it in a drawer and forgot about it. Mm -hmm. They were constantly, they didn't have a fixed home from 1805 until 1809. Really, 1800 to 1809, because 1800 was when they moved to Bath. And... So they were renting things, they were visiting relatives, they were here, they were there, they went to the seaside. So she's carrying this thing around with her. Um, she doesn't just throw it in the trash, throw it in the fire, but she doesn't finish it. So what was she thinking? Mm -hmm. It's a really 
really interesting question. She wasn't going to let it go. Yeah, and and you know I think as a as a writer yourself, like you know that there's things you write and you're like, eh, you know, but I'll keep it around. Just it might inspire me later. Maybe it was like that. But I'm not sure I'd carry it around to Bath and all right. the other places. Because now you either, can just have it you know, on your hard drive, right? right? So she must have been very attached to this manuscript. I mean, there right. must have been something that she really wanted to work out with it. Right, right. Or she wanted to somehow remind herself of something. Maybe she, you know, some people have suggested that she was reusing certain themes and that they show up in other places. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's a really, it's a really fascinating, to me that's so, so interesting, that mystery of the Watsons. And you know, did she just decide, but if she decided it was completely hopeless, then why did she keep it? Why did she keep it? But if it was, if it wasn't hopeless, why didn't she finish it? Right? So, I mean, <laughs> may, or maybe if she'd lived longer, she would have gone back to it in another form. Of course, her illness might have prevented her from doing serious work on it. Um, right, well, when she got, remember when she got sick, she'd already started a completely new work. Mm -hmm. She'd started Sanditon. Um, so at that time, you know, so she revised, she revised Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice. And then once those were sort of like, she'd sold Sense and Sensibility, she was, looked like she was going to be able to get Pride and Prejudice published. And then she starts writing Mansfield Park. And so at that point, from then on, Mansfield Park, Emma, Persuasion, Sanditon, she's writing completely new stuff. She's not revisiting. She got Northanger Abbey back, but she never reworked it. She just, and her family ended up publishing it. So when did she start the Watsons? Um, it's thought sometime, sometime in the period when she was living in Bath. So sometime before her father died. Mm -hmm. So it was sometime between 1800 and 1805. Um, so she carried that around for a lot, a lot of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's it's really fascinating. This program was recorded on March seventh, two thousand and eighteen, at the Ann Arbor District Library.